The Lord be with you. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Mark, chapter 5, beginning at verse 21. Praise, Praise and Lord glory Lord. to God. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the lake. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet, and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death, Come and lay your hands on her, that she may be made well and live. So he went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, If I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that the power had gone from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say, who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him. And when he went went in where the child was, he took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. At this they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise, Praise to Christ. Christ. Amen. 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 Katanuku ie, katanuku ko a te tehi o tabaki e katanuku. He kapo ki te fetu, he kapo ki te marama. He kapo ki te ata o aku raukura kariro e katanuku. <coughs> Tēnei ka tautoko kaunga mihi a kewi ki a koutou, wa tāmai nei roto i tēnei rā, ka... Whakanui tātou tēnei rā i pau ai to ko teirau whātakau tau e tū nei tēnei whare. E mihi nei ki tō tātou pō piopa, ki a piopa ras. Ko te piopa i mua tu ia e piopa kau e nāna i kawa, i, I takitaki te kawa o te karaki ko nei. Ko teirau whātakau tau ki muri, ko tātou ngā uri o roto o tēnei rā. Ko ia... Ka mihi ki a koutou katoa i te rā nei, tēnā koutou. He iriri tā tātou i roto i tēnei karakia, wāhi mokopona tā tātou, he uri no roto o Ngāti Kau, he uri no roto o Ngāti Porau. Uh, he uri no Ngāti Kau. E merita, ka mihi ki a koe, ka mihi ki te whānau, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou. I join with Kerry's welcome and also giving to you today a short history of this church. 140 years ago, where it was consecrated by the then Bishop of Auckland, Bishop Cowie. And for 140 years, we give thanks to God 
for all of the, the witness that has taken place in this church, for the gospel that has been preached here, the scriptures that have been heard, read here, the sacraments that have been celebrated of Eucharist, of baptism, of confirmation, of ordination, of holy matrimony. Somehow today we bring together the history of this church, but also the witness of the Māori mission. For the last 52 years, this church has been the centre for the Auckland Anglican Māori mission. Te mihana Māori o Tāmaki Makaurau. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. On Friday meet, morning at a meeting I was with in Newmarket, I watched interestingly at a person trying to park a car. It's a small car. Actually, I was sitting next to Bishop Ross. I was looking straight down the road, and I was watching this car try to fill into a small gap. Looked to be, to be quite small. Anyway, the driver tried and tried and tried. He or she kept trying for about 10 minutes. At one point, the car, the rear, the rear wheels on the footpath, parked this way, here, yeah, this way, parked that way. I see a lot of cars parked like that in Mangere. I saw one in Kawakawa just the other day. Right on the footpath, the front wheels on the footpath. Lots of patience by this person, lots of determination, lots of effort, but not one single ounce of success. Perhaps there was not much faith either, or hope, and very little prayer. Didn't look right, so the driver obviously gave up and gapped it, <laughs> leaving the space empty. That's what I thought, but do you know, a few minutes later the car was back again. Obviously because he found no other options nearby. This time, the driver just calmly backed in. And I thought, how wonderful. Backed right into that little gap. The cars on either side hadn't moved. Nothing had changed. This time, the driver must have had a bit more confidence or more determination, probably, and probably a lot of frustration. You see what can be achieved with sheer determination. It could be a case of 99% desperation, 1% determination, or even 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. But I thought, well done, just came back and back straight in. It seemed to be quite um, uh, uh, easy this time around. But there you go, nothing, never give up on trying again, never give up on taking a chance, and never give up on hope. As a young Christian, one of my favorite choruses began with the words, Te Panga o Te Ariki Kiao. We sang it just now. We sang it at 8 o'clock. We sang it last week at Mototo, didn't we, David? David led the singing at Mototo last week. Te Panga o Te Ariki, the words were up there before. Kiao, Fakatata Kiaia, Ka Fakatata, my ear, Te Panga o Te Ariki Kiao. In English, to get a touch from the Lord is so real. If you draw nigh to him, he will draw nigh to you. To get a touch from the Lord is so real. We sang this in the church, the congregation that we belong to over 40 years ago. We sang it in Māori and we sang it in English. As was the custom with choruses or praise songs, unlike our normal Anglican hymns, we'd sing it over and over and over again singing the refrain several times. But the hallelujah would ring through our voices, would ring through our hearts, and ring through our minds until we felt we said enough hallelujah for the day and even for the week. All the hallelujahs we sang lasted us for that week. Today's gospel draws our attention to the power of Jesus' touch in the lives of at least two individuals. The impact of his touch left them all singing their own form of hallelujah, silent and aloud. His healing touch brings joy and gladness after a certain period of desperation, frustration and disappointment. Of course, these two accounts of his healing touch impacts a greater number, blessing more people than the two persons who actually received healing. 
The family members witnessed to Jesus' willingness and openness in responding to a deep desire and a longing for him to hear their cry for help. In fact, in the case of the woman with the long-term illness, we see her making the extreme effort to seek Jesus out to help her in her absolute despair. It's like this person trying to park the car. Keep going, keep going. She simply believed in herself. And you know, she had no other option. This was her last option available to her to receive restoration of her life. There was no one to help her, no one to support her, no one she could turn to, and there was no one who would advocate on her behalf. Despite this huge obstacle in her way, she was able to muster up the strength to push away her way through the crowd and to draw near to Jesus. In the Maori text, it said, Kapopo, te tangata kia ihu, kapopo. They were just all around him, all over him. She found the energy, despite that, to stand up for herself. And she had the utter belief in herself. She only had to touch the hem of Jesus' garment to be restored to fullness of life. Kia pā tana ringa ki te remu o te kākahu o te karaiti ka ora aia, ka fifi oranga aia. So what great faith that she have in herself. Not only faith, but also immense trust. Hers was a life of 12 years, of one failure after another, after another, having been let down over and over and over again. Most people would have given up, wouldn't they? Some may not even have attempted to try to look for help. I marvel that she had the good sense to keep looking ahead, I celebrate that she never gave up, and I sing my own hallelujah that she persevered with the little hope it appears that she had. What kind of person must we be to move from one challenge to the next while keeping our eyes fixed on our one chance, our one single chance for salvation? And how great, how big should our faith be to overcome years and years of despair and how long should we hold on to receive healing after experiencing one disappointment after another? The answer which the woman shows us in her sterling example is that we must never lose faith, however little we might have in our reserves. We must never allow discouragement and failure to determine or shape our future. And we must never allow doubt or fear to discourage us from the blessing, the anointing that awaits us in our trials and our tribulations. We must remember that any amount of faith in God's power to heal, any measure of trust in God's promise to hear the cry of the humble, and any portion of hope in God's ability to know our hearts and our minds before we even say a single word, will always lead, it will always lead to life of blessing, of true salvation, and of real joy. The amazing part of the story of faith is that the woman does not ask or request healing from Jesus. She simply believes that she would receive healing with or without Jesus' permission or prior knowledge. In a way, she takes from Jesus what she is entitled to. By no means, though, is she a thief. She is, a, she is confident that what she will gain is freely given and is freely received. She is adamant that what she seeks, what she expects, what she desires, what she hopes for is available to her and is all she will ever require. Jesus, we learn, becomes aware of the woman who touched his clothes. He knows what happens to her and the effect to himself only after the fact. He knows that someone in touching his cloak has acquired some of his mana, some of his power. This is the real miracle in this healing story, in my mind. And immediately she drops to her knees in fear. She falls down, perhaps she is embarrassed, perhaps she is guilty. And she opens her heart to Jesus, tells him the whole truth of her life. She leaves nothing out, and Jesus rewards her by sending her on her way. Hare mai haere, heitana. Hare mai haere. 
She is free to go in peace. And she does go in peace because not only must she do so, but because now she can go in peace. She has both the strength and the gladness of being restored and healed. She would have felt the happiness again of being valued by being reintegrated into her community. And she departs from Jesus having been called daughter. Hare mai hare e ko, ko fifi koe te oranga tonutanga. The healing power of Jesus is available for all with or without his permission. His words of affirmation of the woman's incredible courage and her tremendous faith are, are an added dimension of the healing. It allows her to continue on her way with the real joy of faith. It enables her to keep going with the reassurance that her perseverance has paid off. It authorizes the woman to speak confidently of her journey from darkness to light, from anguish to relief, from weakness to courage, and from despair to hope. The second healing story is of a girl, another daughter. The suffering and hopelessness is similar except it is her father, Jairus, who seeks help. Jesus arrives by boat, and the crowds surround him, they press upon him, watching, waiting, praying, and hoping, all wanting desperately to be in his presence. Like the woman, Jairus summons up the courage to approach Jesus. But unlike her, he is a rangatira. He is a leader in the synagogue. He has mana. He has status. Like her, he knows, though, about the power and authority especially from a faith perspective. He knows that he simply has to ask. After falling at the feet of Jesus, he begs him for help. The woman, after being healed, healed fell down at the feet of Jesus in, in fear and trembling, feeling unworthy. Jairus requests permission. He too knows the power of Jesus to heal and restore life to his daughter. Like the woman, he is at, at the end of his prayer. He has no other option. At the feet of Jesus, both have their prayer answered. One is a silent prayer, the other an audible prayer. But both receive the same outcome. Jesus responds immediately, he acts accordingly, and healing occurs instantaneously. Jesus heals among the throngs of the crowd in one instance, in the second story, he follows Jairus' home where his daughter is. He goes from one daughter to another. This daughter was 12 years old. She had lived as many years as the woman who had experienced her illness at the same time who had been suffering. Now, Jesus already on his way to the house of Jairus when certain voices began to say, hey, it's all over. They were saying to Jesus, you're too late to do anything. There's no point in troubling him. Of course, Jesus was not deterred from his mission to heal, to restore and to affirm life. When they arrived at the house of Jairus, the people, people scoffed at him, that his insistence that she was not dead, so he ordered them out. He sent away the negativity from the center. He cast out the doubters. He threw out the unbelievers. Doubt and unbelief did not belong to that house. Doubt and unbelief had no place in the girl's world. Doubt and unbelief will never lead to healing and can never contribute to life. Jesus, Jesus simply reaches out his hand to hers. His touch, his voice, his words lift the girl from her bed, enabling her to stand and walk. Her parents, especially Jairus, was amazed. They all left speaking only among themselves of this great wonder which they had seen and experienced. They leave singing their own hallelujah. In an encounter with Jesus, there is no place for fear or disbelief. Fear and doubt have no place in Jesus' presence. Fear and unbelief have no right to be in the same place where Jesus is to be found. Fear and disbelief do not belong where Jesus reigns and where the followers and believers reside. This healing story begins with despair and ends with real hope. 
It begins with emptiness and ends with wholeness. It begins with gloom and ends with lasting joy. It begins with hopelessness and ends with faith. It begins with frustration and ends with real peace. It shows us that our hope in God is a much stronger force than doubt. It proves that the light of Christ and the face of darkness always shines brightly. It demonstrates to us that the love of Christ, a much more powerful reality in the world, brings freedom, healing, and life. This causes us to sing our own hallelujah, not just in our hearts, but also in the public square, among the crowds we gather with, in the privacy of our homes and from the rooftops. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus is coming again. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.